is late May, 1863, and Confederate President Jefferson Davis has called a war council at the White House of the Confederacy in Richmond. In the third week of May, I convened my cabinet, along with my commander of the Army of Northern Virginia, General Lee, to weigh matters of the gravest concern. Numerous letters and telegrams had been received from Governor Peters of Mississippi, which I read aloud to the council. General Grant was threatening our citadel at Vicksburg, and there was much need for reinforcements from our Army of Virginia to be sent to General Johnston's aid. While discussing how we should implement our strategy, matters took a grievous turn for the worse. Word arrived that General Johnston had already withdrawn without a fight, leaving General Pemberton's army to fight Grant alone and Vicksburg virtually unprotected. Something had to be done decisively, but many members expressed that Vicksburg may already be lost and that we should strengthen the defense of Richmond, collect supplies for a six-month siege, and at the proper time dispatch 30,000 of General Lee's troops to Vicksburg. General Lee expressed serious doubt of sending troops from Virginia to the Western Theater. He expressed that, where he required to send a portion of his army west, he would also be compelled to act upon the defense of Virginia. Once his army was pinned up in the Richmond defenses, he believed defeat would be inevitable. He went on to lay out his case for keeping the Army of Northern Virginia intact and using it to take the war into Pennsylvania. General Lee recommended drawing the Army of the Potomac into the open and winning a decisive victory over them on northern soil, which would hopefully bring peace. George G. Meade, Major General, United States Army. Early on the morning of June 28th, I had received orders that placed me in command of the Army of the Potomac. Meade addresses his men. The country looks to you, this army, to relieve it from the devastation and disgrace of a hostile invasion. And I rely upon the hearty support of my companions in arms, you, my soldiers, to assist me in the discharge of the important trust which has been confided in me. General John Buford. General Pleasanton, my extreme left reports a large force coming from Fairfield in a direction to strike the Emmitsburg Road this side of Marsh Creek. Colonel Gamble has just sent word that General Lee himself has signed a pass for a citizen this morning at Chambersburg. The troops that are coming here were the same I found early this morning at Millersburg or Fairfield. General Reynolds has been advised of all I know. I am very respectably your obedient servant, J.N.O. Buford. Marcellus E. Jones, 8th Illinois Cavalry. A little after 7 o'clock, the enemy's advance, composed of Archer's Tennessee Brigade, followed by Davis's and Brockenborough's brigades, appeared in sight on the hill west of Marsh Creek a mile or so away. Upon sighting our picket post, they deployed skirmishers on either side of the road with the precision of veterans marching steadily down the pike to the stone bridge over Marsh Creek. I had sent the horses and a quarter of the men to the rear. The enemy crossing the bridge. Firing began along both lines. Our pickets fell back slowly until the reserve came up when they too dismounted sending horses to the rear. And here, let me say, if ever men fought with desperation, it was that morning. Lieutenant General James Longstreet. On the morning of the 1st, General Lee and myself left his headquarters together and had ridden three or four miles when we heard the heavy firing along Hill's front. General Lee had left me and hurried forward to see what it meant. In the meantime, General Gamble's brigade had formed on the top of the ridge, McPherson's Ridge, running along the east side of Willoughby Run. Two guns in the 8th Illinois Cavalry on the left of the pike, and two guns balanced of the brigade in the right of the pike, and there awaited the enemy's advance. The firing proceeded from the engagement between our advance and the Federals on Seminary Ridge. General Meade, the enemy forces, AP Hills, are advancing on me at this point and driving my pickets and skirmishers very rapidly. There's also a large force at Heidlersburg that is driving my pickets at that point from that direction. General Reynolds is advancing and is within three miles of this point with his leading division. I'm positive that the whole of A.P. Hill's force is advancing. J.N.O. Buford. About 10 o'clock in the morning, General Anderson, while resting with his division at Cashtown, received a message from General Lee. General Anderson, 
I cannot think what has happened to Stuart. I ought to have heard from him long before now. He may have met with disaster, but I hope not. In the absence of reports from him, I am in ignorance as to what we have in front of us here. It may be the whole Federal Army, or it may be only a detachment. If it is the whole Federal Force, we must fight a battle here. If we do not gain a victory, those defiles and gorges through which we passed this morning will shelter us from disaster. Move your division to Gettysburg at once. General Pleasanton, I'm satisfied that Longstreet and Hill have made a junction. A tremendous battle has been raging since 9.30 a.m. with varying success. At the present moment, the battle is raging on the road to Cashtown and within a short cannon range of this town. The enemy's line is in a semicircle on the height from north to west. General Reynolds was killed early this morning. In my opinion, there seems to be no directing person. We need help now. J.N.O. Buford. Sir! Sir! Lieutenant General James Longstreet. I overtook General Lee at 5 o'clock while General Hill was finishing his report on the day's fight. General Longstreet. General Lee and I discussed what to do next. Fine, sir. Where's your corps? My corps is back the other side of Cash Town right now in camp. They pulled out of uh, Chambersburg early this uh, this morning, but they're jammed up back there. Uh, the lead elements are, are jammed up behind them. Supply trains. Johnson come down to Mummersburg Road and got to see the, all the roads clogged up with his wagons. There's nowhere to park them. We just gonna have to wait till they get out of the way. W. S. Hancock. General Meade, when I arrived here an hour since, I found our troops had given up the front of Gettysburg in the town. We have now taken up position in the cemetery which cannot well be taken. It is a position, however, easily turned. Slocum is now coming on the ground and is taking a position on the right, which will protect the right, but we have yet no troops on the left. The third corps not having yet reported, but I suppose that it is marching up. If so, Sickles' flank march will in a degree protect our left. The battle is quiet now. I think we'll be all right for the night. I think we can retire. If not, we can fight here as the ground appears not unfavorable with good troops. I communicate in a few minutes with General Slocum and transfer command to him. General Howard, the orders take command to the front. Would you care to see them? No, I do not care to see them. Double Day's command broke, and there is no time to talk. Go ahead, Hancock. Very well, sir. Morgan, I want you to take a portion of the First Corps and occupy that hill. Yes, sir. We have won a great victory today. The men have performed bravely in the face of our enemy. The great battle will resume in the morning with the Federals on the heights. Still, I do not know how many troops we face. Is it the entire Federal Army? I should have heard from Stuart. I do not know the ground. It's all in God's hands. Now.